Hey Seekers, what is up? If you don't know, at the channel we are bringing you a little project where we are showcasing some fine young minds that are exploring mysticism. My friends, the boys and girls who are my colleagues in this beautiful search. This coming conversation is with a good friend of mine, Shul Solomon. In the conversation, we get to hear Shul's story, Shul's philosophy about creating the holy, creating the sacred. We get to talk about the hard problem of consciousness, AI, data science, mysticism, and the nature of consciousness. My friend Shul is a endlessly inquisitive deep thinker. And I very much enjoy all my conversations with him, including this one. And I hope you enjoy it too. So. Are you ready recording? Are you there? Shal Solomon. Hello. Say I. Why? Because I have to serve you your notice. I have to find out that this is actually Shal. Oh. Um, I. Shal Solomon is passionate about development of philosophy and God in Eastern and Western religions. <laughs> um, currently studying data, data science, data science, machine learning, the nature of consciousness and its relationship to AI and Buddhism naturalized. His upcoming video is reconceptualizing the boundaries of the natural and the supernatural. And the idea that's currently possessing Shell is universal truths in religion for the non-religious yet spiritual. His favorite thinker is Alan Watts. He's currently reading History of God by Karen Armstrong. Welcome, Shul Solomon. I'm no longer reading History of God by Karen Armstrong. What are you, what are you reading? Um, I'm currently reading the last book, Therathustra by Nietzsche and The Unconditional Self by Jung. Unconditioned Self. The Unconditioned Self. Yeah, I just started it. Do you think Jung and Nietzsche would get along if they went to a bar together? Or would they get into a drunken fight? What would they, th what would they think of each other? I think they would have a good time with each other. I think they're very similar. Yeah, how so? Uh, this is really not my field of expertise at all. But I don't know, the, the one thing that's happening between both is is um, reading Das Book der Fustra and talking about the Ubermensch, right? The actualization of self. And uh, Jung in this whole book is basically attacking religion and communism and all really any large society that, that uses its people and instead of serving them, which is basically every community, is an attack on the, the need for self actualization. You know, they each use their own terms for the same thing, but it's about. Uh, looking inwards and not outwards. About looking inwards and outwards. Fair enough, I hear. Uh, Shal, in your uh, journey of self-actualization, where does your journey begin? I want to hear your story. <laughs> where should we begin? Ah, uh, born and raised. Begin with your first incarnation. My first incarnation, um, no. I don't this this this, 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 this current one, go. So, <laughs> um, okay, really, like, like where I was born and stuff, or just more of my connection to spirituality? Um, tell the story as you, as you, as you'd like. It's your story. Okay. Uh, born and raised in Lubavitch, Chassid. My family was... Very passionate in a let's, very not overly intense. Mm -hmm. Let's let's um let's try to keep our language universal so that the broader audience can all get a clue on what we're saying. Ah, okay. Um, I grew up in the Chabad community of the Hasidic, uh, of the Hasidic sect Chabad. Uh, my family was religious, but not extremely religious. We had a enough from allowed to share private secret secrets. We had a TV in the house. Uh, which is not, cool. most families don't have that. We can edit that out of the... Actually, 
I'm going to have to ask my father for it. If it's okay for me to talk about these things. I'm going to stop um, interrupting you, go. Yeah, sorry. Um, and the only difference was my parents was very pro getting a second education. My parents want, believed in both. Can be both educated and also from and, and for care. That's the, that's the beautiful medium that they wanted educated, to Educated and religious. Yeah, educated and religious, thank you. Uh, so we went to modern orthodox school until high school, and then I went straight from like a modern orthodox background, all my friends are modern orthodox, to the intense Hasidic world, um, where, where most of the class were guys who stayed, who came from the Hasidic world, never studied any English. Um, and I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. Like, all we knew about Chabad, my sect, was that there's something about the Rebbe, the leader, being the Messiah, and that everybody liked alcohol. That we were alcoholics. That That's, was known. Oh, and we used to keep, and we used to keep Chol of Yisrael, which means like a high stringency of of, of of kosher, and which meant I couldn't eat the donuts that the class were eating for Sunday's bar mitzvah. Wait, this is what they knew what about. This is what they knew about you, or what you knew about yourself. This is what I knew about myself. At what age? Until high school. Okay. So I went to Chabad Shul to Davin. I prayed at the Chabad Synagogue. Um, I put on two pairs of tefillin in, in the Chabad custom. Like I was doing everything that a Chabad kid did. I just had no idea what it meant. Anyway, ended up in the yeshiva system. Uh, didn't connect. Didn't work for me. I was a good kid as a studious kid. So I, so I got good grades. I was in the top classes. I created like the... I was, president of the debate society and I was on the student council and I was co-editor in chief of the yeshiva newsletter which sounds really amazing if it was any high school except for yeshiva like <laughs> those titles don't mean anything <laughs> but <laughs> the point was like my hands were in a lot of pies you know I was very involved but I didn't really care so much about Siddish Kai developing deeply like I was a spiritual kid I always connected uh, Judaism was always a source of beauty for me and I really loved like most kids went to like the kids group where they would sing and pray with them and I would just sit next to my father and pray you know I didn't come for prizes I just came like I came I prayed behaved went anyway when I turned 17 uh, through really a crazy series of events I ended up in a religious school a yeshiva in Israel um, I knew basically nothing about it. Um, I knew I knew basically nothing about it to the fact that I got there on the first day and I found out that everything was going to be in Yiddish. I found that on my first day there. Wow! And I don't speak Yiddish. Wow! And all Which the classes yeshiva was were this? in Yiddish, and all the Ferengans. What? Which yeshiva was this? This yeshiva was Yeshiva's Chabad Cholon. Uh, which is the Chabad Yeshiva, one of the the only real. Uh, Chabad Yeshiva in Israel made specifically and only for Americans. Interesting. Um, so you yeah. rock up to Cholon and they're only speaking Yiddish. Do you speak Yiddish at the time when you rock up? No. <laughs> to, the only word I knew was garnished, you know? <laughs> you knew how to say I don't speak Yiddish in Yiddish. Not, not even fully, but like, <laughs> they got the point very quickly and got the point very quickly. Yes. yes. Um, I get there. Basically, I, something clicked in my head very early on. Um, and also, by the way, just to put it, the guys who went to full on my year were some of the top guys from all the yeshivas around the world. So I ended up going to a top yeshiva, uh, not really even intending to. You know what I mean? I kind of just happened. Anyway, very, very quickly, it clicked. Something clicked. Um, it was particularly one of the rabbis, Rabbi Grisman, who, for the first time, I saw somebody who really lived how Judaism, as far as I understood it then, should have been lived. He was a really dedicated human being. He used to, uh, Davin Belveda used to pray in depth and in length every day. Um, 
And I'm pretty, and it wasn't even the point. I think for him, like just to give an example, which is purely speculation, but it's really it would encapsulate him as a person. I don't. He wasn't having the kind of level of, of like connection that the old Hasidim were having a lot of the Bashem. I don't think he was really Bislavas. But I think for him, he knew the importance of what the happening was supposed to be. And then every single day he ref- he, he struggled and he wrestled with the happening. You know, if prayer is supposed to be a wrestle, a fight with God, trying to connect with him and trying to make it meaningful. Uh, and most people just like, like abandon it, uh, you know, especially if I don't start living a normal job guided by purity and, 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 and a clarity. Anyway, it was a level of clarity that I just didn't even know existed. One second. Yeah, his, his, his Judaism was pure and authentic as, you know, as, as humans go. And there's a certain point of like, it, it, it clicked to me. You know, before it was just, you know, a lot of rabbis getting really drunk or, you know, they would speak to me and I just feel like they really weren't talking my language. You know, I come from a very prestigious family. So when I used to go to the rabbi, he's always to be, do you know who your great grandfather is? Do you know the stories about your great, great grandmother? And I'd be like, yeah, I know them. So what, you know what I mean? Like it's hope. And every time I went, he'd tell me the same thing. And there was some level of just like, I would go, you'd have to go see him like once every two months. And I would just sit there and just go, mm-hmm, yes, thank you. And then just leave. Um, and it wasn't because I was antagonistic. It just didn't matter to me. Like he didn't, he didn't connect. And this rabbi in Israel, Rabbi Grisman, he really spoke to me. And it really, something really worked. And I decided that, you know what, I don't know what's going to be for my future. But right now, I have an opportunity to see if the chizik lifestyle works for me. And if I don't allow myself to try it now, I'm not going to have this opportunity. This is an opportunity to really, so at that moment, I made a resolution that for my time in yeshiva, I would, I would, you know, no sneaking any phones, no, no, not Jewish music, no, not Jewish books, no movies, no talking to girls. Not that I was speaking to them anyway before, but like a, a resolve. And very quickly, I, you know, if you take the um, Eye of the Tiger montage, you know, but instead of like, it's just me going like this and drinking a lot, you know, like that's a lot of studying, a lot of drinking. And a lot of Mifsoyim, and which is Jewish outreach. And I'll let you know something. It was really hard for me, always. Like, I, it never got easy for me. And it never got pleasant. Uh, what is, what is Mifsoyim for those that aren't many people. For those that I'm familiar with? It. OK. Uh, the the Lubav Cherebi, who today is actually his 100 and 18th birthday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so he established a, f- a few initiatives, and the point was that you have to go out and spread Judaism to the whole world, and that every Jew uh, has a right, and well, also a, a commandment, but also a right and a beauty to connect to God, and we have to bring it to them. And one of the things was wrapping tefillin um, on strangers. We would go up to them, ask them if they were Jewish, and ask them if they would like to put on tefillin. And then sometimes we would share a word of wisdom, a word of terror. Um, yeah. And I used to do it every week. Uh, there, was, there was a time where I was doing it when I was in Crown Heights. I went to Flatbush. And there was one of those Bochum who would come on the last train home, you know, like literally come in as the, as the, the, the siren is running, sharp as is here, run to the mikveh, you know, and just like go back into my clothes because I couldn't take a towel because sharp is you know, like kind of, uh, anyway, the good old days. Um, yeah, so I became very into it, very given over, very, and I loved it. It was beautiful to me. It was geschmack. Uh, it was, it was pleasurable. Um, and, and for a few years, I was mamish. I was really dedicated. There was a period of time I thought I was going to become a Chabad rabbi, specifically on campus, because I thought like, I can best speak to college kids, talk to them ideology, they don't understand logic. Um, long story short, I decided to go to college instead. Um, but during this whole time, I was still very religious. Um, 
yeah, and then I started, and then started my journey uh, leaving. Um, and I don't know how much I'm going to get into that because it's actually a very long story. Um, but when I, there's me understanding what's happening to me while it's happening and me having the hindsight looking back at it now. And so when I talk about the period of leaving, while it was happening, I didn't think I was leaving. What did you think? That wasn't what, I thought I was looking into a question. There was a question that was bothering me, a very simple question. And the real simple question is, is what is the nature of faith? How what do I the... know that I actually believe or, or do I know that I'm being told that I believe? Hmm? What is the nature of faith? That was the question. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because religion plays a very fun game with faith, which is they'll say, you believe, but it's so rational, obviously that God believes, right? And then you start saying, okay, well, according to rationality, this and this, and then say, no, but that's when you go and have faith. Well, well, then what parts are faith and what parts are rationale? If you're saying it's all faith-based, then people who are jihadists or people that are extremists, they're their religion is also valid, right? So you have to accept that, so you, is truth objective? And then you have a right to say what truth is? Well, then how do you know what you're, then on what basis are you making sure that you're right and someone else's truth isn't right? And if your truth is subjective, then any truth is fine. If the whole point of it is that it's coming from the heart. And yet they always say, no, it's morally re reprehensible or that it's logically inconsistent, but then we're talking, but then why is logic important here? Anyway, there's a question that for me, um, I thought it was such an obvious question, but obviously religion had to have an answer to this question because it seems so simple, you know? Like, if you're going up in it, you have to ask yourself, why wouldn't I believe? But let's say you're going outside and someone says, I want you to believe in this ideology, and you say, why? It's just because you should have faith. Then why? Because it makes sense. Okay, what's the logic? The logic is you need to have faith. As in there was something, in it that didn't connect. Sure. Um, by studying this, I got exposed to a few people. How, uh, what, what, where, how, I was how old are we now at this time? And, and I, right now, I am 22. Yes, so um, you're, okay. you're having these, this crisis of faith at, at around the age 22. Yeah, but it, at that time, I didn't think I was having a crisis of faith. I, my thought was, there was a part of me in the back of my mind thought I was gonna write a book. And I felt that the biggest issue that you have nowadays with, with young people is that you don't really explain to them why they should believe. Right. Right? Once they believe, I can explain to you what, why, why there's, where there's benefit in it. Right? If you're telling me, is it good for you? I could tell you, of course it's good for you. Look, look what's out there. But I didn't do it because it was good for me. I did it because out of biddle, out of nullification, out of connection to God. So I was doing it because it's truth. Well, then how can you prove it's truth? Like for me, I felt that this is the issue that I was struggling with so many people around. And then once I could find this answer, which I thought it was obvious that it existed, it wasn't clearly written straight out, but it must have been there, that I could write this and share this with people and I think would change a lot of people's lives. Um, within this general reading and exploration of our faith, I think it was my brother, I'm not exactly sure, somebody asked me, and what if I, And what if through my studying, I find out that I'm wrong, that my ideology isn't true, that my faith isn't right? What would I do that information? I still believed, but I was posed with the question is, what if, what I, what is more important, you know, peace or truth in the simplistic way, right? Continue with what I know, like you know, I'll give up, no longer believe, but I've dedicated all these years and countless hours and, and really everything that I had at that moment was really dedicated. To, to, to God, and particularly the God of, of my upbringing, um, what do I give it up? And I remember it was another Chabad holy day, it was Yud Beis Tammuz, and I had two friends over on my roof for a little for and a little get together, and, and I asked the question to them, both Chabad, both very smart, both top yeshivas, uh, and one said that he still stayed from, uh, and one said, he doesn't know. Um, and I said that I would leave. Um, 
I think each of us are kind of one. The one who said he's still from Minnesota, from I am currently not religious, and the one that says he doesn't know, I think is still in the state of I don't know. So I think there was a lot of it was kind of a um, which at that time again I was still a believer. I invited them over for the for bringing. Like it wasn't like I was looking for a way out. Right. You know. Um, actually, funny enough, I was speaking to one of my old rabbis about this, and maybe we'll get to this at the end. Um, but people always think, oh, you're leaving, you're looking for a way out, you know? And I think for me, on the contrary, once I realized that my simplicity popped, my Judaism of, 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 of youth was no longer there. I was looking for a way in, not for a way out. Uh, I think I have my own ways in now, but it's very funny. I, I was really not trying, I was never trying to run away from Judaism. Still not. It just it was inc- became incompatible for me. Basically, I decided while this was happening and I was on my journey that I would not limit myself to only reading purely Chabad literature. It felt unfair that if I was going to allow myself to ask the question and really allow myself to explore, I have to have no boundaries and read anything. And my, I thought my logic was very simple. If after 22, 23 years of upbringing in a, in a particular community, following their ways, learning only their books, one book can shake their entire faith, then not only would I not want to like, I would want to read the book right now, you know? So I started reading a little bit of philosophy, but mostly I got into um, Buddhism, particularly Alan Watts. Um, I also got exposed to the ideas of Terence McKenna. Um, and kind of really also within Judaism, I got exposed to the Heschel uh, and Examen Shaft the Shalomi, um, and you know, existentialism, uh, Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, uh, uh, Camus, and Sartre were both very big figures for me back then, I still are in many ways. Um, and basically, I consider myself at that period of time a Buju because I was still from, still very religious, but I, I thought Buddhism had so much to give and I was meditating every day. I was davening chakras also, not three times a day, but I was doing the morning prayer and I was meditating every day. Um, and I think over a period of time, I think I realized that for me, the reason why Judaism was true was because it gave me so much to my life, you know, and things that I, that Judaism claimed that only, t- that only God could give you and God could only give you through, through, through revelation, which is only through terror. And when I started meditating, I found the same beauty, the same richness in another place. And The question then became, what, why? It was no longer like, do I believe, do I not believe? It was like, I, I realized already that I no longer believed. And the question was only, why, why just be a Jew? Why am I clinging to just one? As in, I was doing both already, but I wasn't because Buddhist theology fundamentally contradicts Judaism pretty heavily. There's a lot of overlap, specifically Zen Buddhism and, and Hasidic uh, theology, um, which is heavily compatible. Uh, you know, the non-self, non-attachment, you know, mindfulness, all this stuff is very relevant in both. But fundamentally, they, they're, they're based on different axioms. So, yeah, I can be a from Jew and meditate, but then I'm still accepting a, a fundamental dogma that, that I don't need to. Um, so then it was just, and then, and then the doors opened. So by that, then I can also study Hinduism and I can study Christianity and Islam and, and you know, open myself up to all ideologies. Um, I was 23 at the time. Um, it was not easy. Um, the hardest thing for me actually was to take off my beard. 
so much so that I didn't take off my beard. I went to a barber. I'm not even to take it all off, but just even to trim it. I, I couldn't even trim my own beard. Like that's how much it, it was like. Shabbos and kosher happened very fast. Like once the ideology left, I didn't feel like, oh no, this is my first time breaking Shabbos. It felt okay, you know, less eventful than it was taking off my beard. And not because I think that now everyone else can see me and know that I no longer believe. The point is that I was no longer, my identity was now uncertain. I couldn't recognize myself in the mirror. Now I live very happily with my wife and kids, <laughs> two boys, two girls, three dogs in a massive estate. No, um, and now I'm here. Um, I don't know how much I should get into my own personal. Let's hear. Mm -hmm. Let's hear. I want to hear. I want to hear Act Two. But um, you don't have to. I mean, you can share as much as you want. That's personal. I want to hear also about your intellectual, your spiritual, your academic, your cerebral, your um, yeah. Okay. What your what so, your so, what your your projects, your plans, your aspirations. Your myth. Okay. Tell me your myth so that the whole world may become myth. Well, the story about myself is definitely a myth. If you think about it, I just created a whole narrative based of some, some parts of history that are loosely correlated. Um, the stories we tell ourselves are myths. They're narrative. For sure. And we tell ourselves the one same reason why we tell the same stories of our ancestors gives us guidance. <clears throat> this is a promotion to my upcoming uh, <laughs> project. No, I don't want to talk about it. Um, basically, for me, I think I got very lucky. Um, as in, I think all of my passions, there's a singularity in general and a singularity uh, in specifics. Um, my, 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 the thing that connects everything together is a singularity and it offers a singularity to all of my passions. Uh, say my biggest passions right now are uh, poetry, philosophy, Eastern mysticism, consciousness, um, and AI. Um, I pretty much spend everything that I do um, is connected uh, to one, if not more, of those topics. Um, the basic idea, I guess, if I want to go to, to a bit of more mystic and a spiritual place. is that holiness is real uh, as much as beauty is real. Um, and it, but it is also holy in the same way that it's beauty, beautiful, which is our own creations, something that we have the power to do. Um, and some people can view that as a somewhat nihilistic point of view, if they would like to, right? Okay, there's no, well then you're rejecting objectivity you know, object, object, um, well, you're denying an objective reality or denying a connection to an objective reality, then nothing is anything. And then why, why can't you do anything, you know? Uh, but I find it very empowering um, that, we, that we create our own holiness. Uh, when we talk about this idea that, you know, man create, God created man, man created God, God is dead, you know, Nietzsche, whatever. Uh, when you think about the idea that man created God, it wasn't just that man created God in his image in the sense of, well, we have passions and desires, so God has passions and desires. You know, we fashion God in our image because fundamentally we, we're, we're looking for more. 
with deep within us. Uh, and the religious person's criticism to the person is, how can you deny this? You know, you say you don't have faith, but you're, you're, you clearly have a soul. You, why are you yearning? If you're just an animal, why do you yearn? And, and my, I think for Kert, I think opposite, like the fact that you're an animal, the fact that you're alive is why you're yearning. It's not a, you know, if we look at the desire to create, the desire for life, the desire for meaning, not as a external soul being put into us that is fighting with our ego, but it is inherently biologically demanded of us as much as it is this desire to, to eat, to drink, to procreate, to have security. It's, it's that, um, so more than ingrained, it is us. Um, I think it doesn't take away from holiness. I just think it gives us the power of realizing the power that we have. Right? We have the power to make things holy. We have the power to... Chassidus talks about the, the three categories, right? Time, space, and person. Right? We, can, we can set aside sacred spaces. We can set aside sacred times, make holidays and celebrations times of mourning, times of reflection. You can set holy places, you know, whether it's a meditation room or it's you know, as part of nature. We can dedicate and we can create holy people. You know, we can, we can, I mean, fundamentally ourselves, we can make ourselves holy. We can sanctify living. Um, and, and, and so kind of the video that I mean, I made and whenever it will come out, uh, I've been, I've been fascinated might, by the I, self. I might release yeah. it as a follow-up. I might release it as a follow-up to this interview. The, uh, the video which you prepared mm. on your conception of, of the sacred and the, and the mundane natural and supernatural. That'd be very nice. Yeah. I would like that. Thank you, Zavi. Pleasure is mine. Uh, <laughs> basically yeah so so i think so my idea so my question now is um what does it mean to be from a very i mean i think from a very say, even semi uh, scientific you know what can we know about ourselves you know and the likelihood is that we can know close to nothing right but can we tap and, into the biggest question about ourselves which is why are we conscious Right. I'm sure you're familiar about the hard problem of consciousness uh, by David Chalmers, but I will give it a quick uh, summary for those who are less familiar. But uh, David Chalmers is a philosopher from Australia, and he basically created this idea called the hard problem, where the easy problem is what is the exact algorithm of the firing of the neurons within the brain that causes us to do whatever functions that our body does. Which obviously is not an easy problem at all. Uh, it's incredibly complex and we are many years away from being able to solve that. If the hard problem of consciousness is why is it like to be doing these things? Why, why, is, why do we have this sensation of tasting as opposed to just the chemical reactions that, that are let off when, you, when sugar is you know, put into the, to the, to the tongue? Um, basically, it's, it's, pretty, um, it's a pretty vast field, but the basic question is, is what does it mean to be? Um, and the natural side effect, not side effect, but the, the next question, if you're staying within the world, scientific world, is, well, then can we, if it, if it is materialistic, which is one of the main camps nowadays, well, then can we create it? Um, which, as a, not a side, it's funny because I'm right now studying data science. Um, and I got fascinated from data science, from the philosophy. Because so actually, I was listening to David Chalmers uh, be on Sam Harris's podcast. I remember, I just started traveling. I was in Thailand at the time. Um, I remember walking around the streets of Thailand, like it just everything feeling very absurd. And then hearing the zombie argument, the maybe we're all zombies, you know. And there was something so um, magical about that absurdity that kind of questioning that kind of openness to can we can like to, does being have to be uh that i became very interested in artificial intelligence and only say even over a year later did i even know that it's a field that regular people work in and you could just study the the latest advance 
investments in artificial intelligence. You can work in it. Uh, so that's what I'm studying now. And obviously not, we, we don't have a class on consciousness. <laughs> it's, obviously the actual coding is a lot more, um, hands-on, you know, but you're working in the, it all comes down to the same, mm -hmm. you're working in the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. But to you, it all comes down to the same one. For me, yeah, I think so. You, you know, I, I don't really have, I don't have an opinion on consciousness. Right. And I don't have any, like, I really don't have, I don't have a side. Right. Um, I, I think the closest thing would be panpsychism, um, but not belief. exactly the belief that, either. The belief that everything is conscious. Yeah, the belief that everything well, is conscious and consciousness is an part of nature itself. Let's, let's, let's start from uh, some first principles. Do you believe that you're conscious? I'm just messing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you um, go over some? I think is actually pretty valid. Um, have you ever seen Buber's critique of, of um, Descartes' argument of cogito? Mm -mm. I would love for you to... It's, a very, it's a very Hasidic well, argument. Yeah. It's a very Hasidic argument. And I think this might segue into my next question, which is uh, Buba says, just because cogito, just because there are thoughts arising in your consciousness, um, in your mind, why do you draw the deduction, ergo sum, therefore I exist? It's like a very egocentric, um, a very separate existence conclusion. Maybe there are just thoughts out there like uh, Aldous Huxley's The Mind at Large, how do you draw from there that, that I, Shel Solomon, exist? That's um, Heschel's, uh, that's Buber's critique in, in a nutshell. You, you're in the middle of telling me about why uh, therefore cogito sum, ergo sum. I didn't right. hear it, I want to hear. Right, so, so Buber says, Buber says to, uh, Rene Descartes, uh, if he was to, if he was a Fabringen, he would say something like this. He's like, you fared, just because you have machshavas. <laughs> Why is it that you're a yash? <laughs> just because there's a cogito, just because there are ideas out there, that means ergo sum, that means you exist? No. <laughs> it's, it's cute, but that's, but that's not what he meant. He... Um, yeah, but that segues into what Buber's critique was of the, that you can't deduce from cogito that there's a, a private person that's, that's separate from all of, all of existence, which is conscious, perhaps. Uh, okay. okay, so here's, here's, here's my, my third and final question to uh, wrap up this, this taster interview. Um, so you have this, strong and abiding interest in, in mysticism, originally steeped in Hasidic Jewish mysticism, and now being inculcated with a, with a uh, infusion of Eastern mysticism, particularly Buddhist, um, and your professional or your um, university training now is in data science, AI, machine learning. Tell me where you see convergences between those two worlds, between the worlds of mysticism, global philosophical mysticism, um, and and uh, artificial intelligence, um, either either theoretical um, points of crossover, or where you're or where where you're where you're applying those fields to one another. Go. Right. Um, in practicality, nothing. Um, nothing for two main reasons. One, we don't have really any clear direction to know what consciousness is. I don't know. And number two, um, studying a bit better the underpinnings of machine learning, understanding what they're actually doing. We're, we're very far on that side also. Um, and most likely, anyway, 
if robots will become conscious, uh, the likelihood is they won't become conscious like a human being is, which is um, both reassuring, but also scary because it means we don't know what that even will look like. It's, it's not really within our grasp. Um, but I think for the, okay, so here's, okay, so, so I'm going to say two things right now that are seemingly a paradox. Right. On the one hand, for me, mysticism is very important that it's mysticism applied. Um, I am less, you know, because I've studied Hasidic teachings, I know a lot about, a decent amount about uh, Jewish Kabbalah. But right now, I don't read those texts again to understand how they believe the worlds are being connected and the type of attributes, how God manifests himself. Um, I do because I think that um, a mystic life is a life best lived um, on the same category as a poet. Um, um, less so a philosopher, I don't think a philosopher is a great life to live, but a noble life to live. Um, I think a poet and a mystic are both, are both there. Um, so for me, mysticism is very much about the day-to-day, -day, which is my, my mysticism also, my philosophy. And on the other hand, I'm deeply curious about the question of, of, of consciousness, where the first thing you realize, the first uh, thing you learn on day one of consciousness is that we don't know what consciousness is, right? It's, it's, it's really speculation, you know? You have some intro like Alice, um, and like the scientific, and the classic like science thought experiment, you know, you have a lot of discussions and. In, in, in Buddhist and specifically Hindu work, they talk a lot about consciousness, but uh, there's no evidence right now to any, to any particular direction. So, so why are they important? Um, and so for me, I think nowadays we talk about this idea of mindfulness um, as a slogan you know as it's, it's it's definitely very much in the zeitgeist of today the idea of of gratitude and mindfulness and, and slutty breaths and yoga and overall i think it's really nice i'm really happy um but i think i think a really important point to understand is that is that Mindfulness is a discipline. Gratitude is a discipline, not a slogan. Um, you know, just like you can't go up to someone and say, oh, just smile. I mean, they can smile, but you can't make them be happy, right? Happiness is something you have to work on. You can't like just tell yourself, okay, I'm, I, I should be mindful and therefore you become mindful. It's a very, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a real, challenge and i think part of mindfulness the exercise of of you know well meditation i really like sam harris's uh, meditation because it's really good and his whole point, his point is kind of like besides for like shunyata the, the the calming exercise there's also just the, expl the explorative element inquire about yourself why are you experiencing what am i experiencing right when we're when you're having a conscious experience which is every experience, but you know those moments when you're in a cont contemplative mood and you can be, take a step back, you know. I find it usually happens sometimes like when, for whatever reason, you're up at three o'clock in the morning. There's always the times it's just like, you really feel yourself as, as existing. Anyway, any of those moments, and you should do it all the time. And meditation to me is this idea. Also, has with several things. Um, Inquire, what, what is it like to, to experience? How, how much am I in control of my headspace? How much am I conscious? You know, going back to what we said before, knowing that we create sacred spaces and sacred moments, how much are we really living with that knowledge of our, of our, of our capacity? And so for me, having the, the studying also the, 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 the theoretical side of it allows me to ask myself, does this like, 
can I, can I, where can I go? And I think, and I think that the, the beauty is, is that you really don't need the philosophy, right? To really know anything about consciousness, it, it, it's, it's, it's the experience side. Um, but I think, I think for me, that's like at the heart of, at, at, at the same time, and this is what I think is so beautiful. You can take the, the deepest mystics, people so drenched in particular theology in a particular way of framing it, and you can take a completely secular person who is in any way completely distant from anything as, anything as an organized religion. And if you get them both talking about consciousness in a very open and raw way, it, the one curiosity there, you know, it's very interesting. Um, I don't know if I'm going too much off tangent. Uh, but it's very interesting that in Hinduism you have this idea of nirvana also, right? Um, nirvana is more of a, of a Buddhist idea, but the, the, the Hindu word is, is moksha, right? Enlightenment. And they talk about this idea in the sort of, at the same time they talk about this idea of complete beingness, like being present, consciousness. And they also talk about this idea of pure bliss. You know, and I think I've spoken to Zebby about this other times. Um, but why is it always correlated? Or is it, or is it inherently correlated? You know, why is, why is it always, like, what happens if the, if, the, if the end of it is just meh? Um, and so some people can just claim it to be wishful thinking, right? It's not actually like that. You know, life is, you're never getting out of yourself. It's always going to be a struggle, which is also true. Um, but I think going back to being inherently biological, this desire for will and desire for meaning, I think finding life beautiful, there's something inherent within being human about, about beauty, right? Beauty and meaning and love and holiness, they're, 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 they're real. And again, but they're, they're disciplines. Um, I don't know if that answers any of your questions. No, it doesn't, but it opens up a whole interesting place to explore. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to talk about this in public. But I do want to I do want to hear at least give the audience a bit of a taster about your current work with uh, AI and, and no? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, only because, honestly, I think we can cut this out. Um, and mm -hmm. though we don't, you can be like, and we could have talked about this, you know, the video, and like even like that. Um, anyway, when I, if the project goes well and something comes out of it, meaningful, I'll speak with you and we can do a whole thing just about it. Okay. Discuss the, the, the philosophy behind it, the, the procedure I can make theoretically even get to the mathematics. Um, like what's actually happening, that'd be also cool, so I can explain, like talk about it from both sides. Until then, I always find that even telling people about, I'm only asked telling you, I only told you, Zabi, because I need your advice when it comes to um, uh, what to get. And also I'm probably going to be employing, employing I'm gonna ask a bunch of friends to help me label the data so so right now i'm, really, I'm trying not to tell people as much cool. as i can it's um, it, you're creating even more intrigue for the audience <laughs> so <laughs> um very cool um are there any final words you want to share with uh, seekers of unity final words uh, um, I, I really, I'm not going to give advice to public because that's just silly. Uh, um, but I, I do want to share one thing that I think uh, isn't talked about a lot because it's personal. So. It's not talked about a lot because it's personal, but like it's very specific to me. Um, 
but it's not. Basically, I, I mentioned this before that for me, since I left, my, my Judaism was trying to find a way in, not to find a way out. Um, and, and I think people hear in that a lot of things that they want to hear. Oh, you never really wanted to leave. Uh, Shama speaking. Um, and if I said that I wanted to leave fully, there was always a lot of projection. And I think, even though I feel very blessed, my parents were leaving. Um, in that regard, it took me a, a really long time to learn that that my my own Judaism, the Judaism is mine to create. And not only is it mine to create in a rebellious act, I see Judaism being mine to create as the creative force that kept Judaism alive all these thousands of years. If you go throughout history, it's always been the forward thinkers who has realized the necessity for change and, and the divine inspiration within the text, if you want to put it like that. Um, that had to make radical shifts to the very structure and nature of the Jewish identity and the Jewish religion um, since the beginning. As in, like, I, it's very hard for me to boil down and to say what, what really has, is like core Jewish ideas, you know, um, not even from like a Bible critic, um, like a Bible criticism point of view, which is a whole other argument, just even for like, when I was a Bachel myself studying, you have to acknowledge that, that, that the, the, the Baal Shem Tov at his, at his time was, you know, he, he created a whole new branch of Judaism, right? The Rebbe says, he will sit back to what it was, but practically as a, as, a, as a system of being within Judaism, he completely reformed it, right? And one can say that Judaism today, a lot of Judaism today is preserved within the Hasidic world. That was that is somewhat lost within within the other than the groups. Um, as such, for me, it was such a point that um, you know when I left when I was twenty three, I thought I would never have anything to do with Judaism anymore. Not because I had anger, but because my Judaism was the one defined by the system that I grew up in, and I said, according to their system, I'm not a part of it anymore. I mean, I'm part of it because I can always come back. Like I would come back to their rules and in, in their definitions, right? That's the Judaism in which I would have to come back to. Um, and, I, and the one thing that I want to share, because I really think it's really important that people have to hear this, uh, to those who are, regardless where they are within their Jewish identity, with, whether they're extremely firm and, and, and spitz, um, whether they're completely, you know, assimilated and, and apathetic. Um, spirituality at its core is a, is a personal journey. Finding God Finding yourself is always done alone um, at the end of the day. And that means you have to listen to yourself, decision as yourself. Say that, one, say that last line one more time. I said that the, the, the final paskin, the final rod, the final rabbi, who's going to make the decision has to be yourself. Um, for me, that I got from Terence McKenna. To be your own guru, uh, that is that is both the beginning and the end of the, of the mystic's journey. Wow, that puts a lot of um, a lot of weight and responsibility on the individual. With the great power becomes great responsibility. The <laughs> statement then. And may we, uh, may we find our capacity to fulfill our responsibility to ourselves. And uh, l'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim. And I think it's a wrap show. I think we're going to... Good job, Tiff. Um, I, think, I do think... Do you yeah. think? There is a minhag, uh, we you do this 
And there is 51 the, the Yom and Lula of a tzaddik, but also you can do the tzaddik to say a few words about the tzaddik. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do think it is fitting. Nachat, I am a Menachat Mandel. And the Rebbe was a very big uh, in my life. Um, there's so many stereotypical tropes to say about the Rebbe to such an extent that it, it really becomes a trope. Love every Jew, love every person, um, light dispels darkness. There's, there's so many established tropes, you know. Um, and I think, and I think the real one is, is for me, one of the biggest ones is that God has to permeate everything. Um, and, and the Rebbe took God as love in, in many ways, unconditional love. And that unconditional love has to permeate everything. Um, and I think that's the way that the Rebbe lived his whole life. And that's definitely the way the Rebbe led as the Rebbe and the way he interacted with every human being. And I think that's definitely something that uh, we all can do, we, we all could benefit from a bit more. Mm. On that point, good job, Tiff. Thank you, Zavi. Thank you, Shaw. Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing that love, and uh, it's been an, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. And um, yeah, I I want to I want to I feel like I want to follow that up with asking your practical question of how does one invite unconditional love into their life? But I think I may hold that off for next session. It's all it's all one though, like it's like whatever I'll be saying I'll be repeating. You know what I mean? Right. I've gotten, I've gotten, I've gotten the coin of the out there, and my owners have been nafis. <laughs> All right, um, cool. So we'll cut it there. I will speak. Nice. Do I just leave? Yeah. I'm hoping to catch some hot mic here. <laughs> thank you very much, Shul, for having this beautiful conversation with me, and thank you for watching. The following video from this is going to be a video which Shul himself made, outlining a bit more of his philosophy in depth. I'm going to post a link in the description when that is available. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you get a notification when that comes out. And in the description is going to be a link to all of Shull's social medias and Shull's website and poetry. Please go check it out, give it a visit, a like, a share, all that good stuff, and make sure to keep seeking. Aha. Uh-huh. Nice.